All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Seth from Sweetfin. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, what does your company do? We sell a lot of fresh, healthy bowls. We are based out of Santa Monica, California. That's where our first location was based out of. About eight years ago, we started, and we are a chef-driven premium poke concept based out of Santa Monica. What made you want to do this thing? Why, why food? Why fast casual? What did you see in the market where you were like, "There's not what's missing? You saw an opportunity. Yeah. What was the, the sort of the first step? Oh, man. So growing up, I was just obsessed with food. I was someone that was always in the kitchen, loved to cook. And I was one of like the first kids, I feel like my age, that loved the Food Network. And I felt like it was the oh, first wow. person where it was socially acceptable to watch the Food Network. And, <laughs> um, so I just always wanted to do something in hospitality. Just loved to host people and be in the kitchen and be around my family while we were cooking. And so I graduated college at USC, studied entrepreneurship, and I knew from a business standpoint, I wanted to build a brand in the food world. And from a business kind of perspective, I knew that the fast casual industry was really starting to, to blow up. What and year was this at that time? It was like 2012, 2013, when I started oh. to first think about ideas. Yeah, that's early Yeah, for the fast casual, okay. Well, we had just come out of like the 2008, 2009 recession. Right. And it was really the birth of fast casual. Chipotle was really to, really taking off Sweet Green, Shake Shack. I remember Bo Loco in Boston was another, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it, yeah, that's when I was living there. It's all these fast casual places were like popping up everywhere. Yeah, so I saw a void in the market. No one, everyone was really doing the same thing. It was like sandwiches, right. pizza, right. salads, and burgers. Right. And I wanted to do something that was fresh and innovative. And I'd had poke a bunch of times. And growing up in LA, I love sushi. It was just like part of how I would eat. And I also wanted to create a brand that was a little bit healthier than the other options. And yeah. had 10 different ideas in my head from this different fast casual ideas. And I just kept coming back with my partner to like, how can we scale sushi? How can we do this? It's possible. Yeah. Someone's going to do it. It's never been done. And if we do it the right way, it's going to take off. Was the goal was, or at least the mindset, was it always to have like a, a bunch of locations or did you want to start on one and then sort of piecemeal it? Like, how did you see it from a business perspective in that way? I mean, I originally was like, we're going to have hundreds of these things. Yeah. That, that's what I wanted to do originally. Okay. Um, I still want to do that. <laughs> I was going to say, you still can. Yeah, we still, we still will. So to start, we knew we needed to, to just prove the concept out. No one knew what we were talking about. So like imagine being in your mid twenties, you've never owned a restaurant. You've never really worked in a restaurant. You've never really owned a business. You've like had a bunch of side hustles and then you're pitching investors for this new fast casual restaurant concept. Crazy. Investors don't really know what fast casual is. They like kind of get it mm -hmm. and they don't know what the category is. They don't understand what you're selling. So like we and would go fish. to investors and we're like, we're doing poke. Like, poke is that like a facebook the facebook poke is that you're doing a social media company literally that was like the response that's a good we would question get. that's funny and yeah that was when like facebook was also i remember um, i remember the infancy. poking um, i'm old enough to remember that yep and so we had a bunch of tastings and we brought our chef and we would sit down with people and we'd have them try the product and they were like really understood like this is fresh this is healthy it's customizable it's portable it really leans into like Asian flavors that were starting where, to become Where would you more. do it? Just like anywhere, like picnic style? No, it was a funny, and I mean, there's or a like bunch of- like at your house like, or something? No, there's a bunch of funny stories. So the way my partnership came about, uh, it was my friend Brett and myself from USC. And then we had this goal of having a hundred poke shops, you know, within the first few years of opening. Yeah. And so we're putting together a business plan and we quickly realized we had absolutely no idea what we were doing. So <laughs> Brett was talking to his dad, uh, who's in South Africa and his dad's like, listen, you guys need a mentor. You need to like talk to someone who's done this before. So he's like, you should talk to this guy named Alan. He lives in LA. He's a little bit older than you. He's more established in the restaurant industry. So we meet with Alan and we're pitching him on this idea. Alan uh, had been running the food and beverage operations at the W at the time in okay. Westwood. And he's like, I think that's a cool idea. I've never done fast casual before either. So this is going to be learning for me, but this could be something that we can work on together. Wow. So Alan joins. And at the time, his chef at the W was a woman named Dakota Weiss, who had just finished filming Top Chef. And so we all sit down. We're at the W. We pitch Dakota. 
Dakota, what do you think about this? And she's like, this is really weird. Um, it's kind of a serendipitous moment. I've never really heard of poke until this last week when one of my line cooks was like, hey, we should add poke to the menu. Wow. So maybe this is meant to be. So we decided wow. to, to all basically become partners, Mo myself, Brett and Allen, and then Dakota, I guess, was a managing partner at the time. And we formed Sweetfin. But to go back to your question, like, where would we do the tastings? We would have the tastings at the W in Westwood. <laughs> nice. But nice. hopefully no one from the W in Westwood is watching this. <laughs> we would like hide the food costs under the PL of like the larger restaurant. I love that. So You're we were like this. having this like so all of these tastings at the restaurant and no one would know like who are these guys? Right. What are they doing here? And why are they always eating That's like a so ton of raw funny. fish? Yeah. And actually like Dakota hired on some of like her cooks and her chefs that were working under her at the hotel and now still like there's some that actually still work for us that's amazing so it, was a, it was a funny time that's a good story there's like some hustle in that there's some scrappiness to it i have a better story actually now that i'm like going back to that time yeah so like we're trying to raise money we have like our first big investor dinner okay so like and how many a, have you had prior to this these or are, like in general? small things like having friends like we're eating sure. stuff like table nothing like major. This. like yeah yeah we're sitting at a table like 30 people we all, you know, I'm, I'm fired up. I'm like trying to get the most important people that I know to like invest in this thing. So we all sit down at uh, the W of course. And Dakota is, this is the first time that she's presented the food in front of this many people. Everything that could go wrong kind of went wrong in terms of just like the pacing of the meal is just really long because she had never prepped for that many people. And sure. it just kind of going on and on and on. And at the end of the dinner, she was supposed to come out and kind of talk about the inspiration behind the menu and just introduce herself and get people excited. <laughs> so she just comes, imagine she, the she comes out. Yeah. I'm like sitting next to like the former CEO of Starbucks, <laughs> like literally everyone I could pull. I'm like, this is going to be amazing. It's not going well. Yeah. So she comes oh, uh, to the head of the table. Literally. I'll never forget this. <laughs> I'm sitting next to my, one of my best friends and she goes, <clears throat> she keeps like clearing her throat, clearing her throat. <laughs> And she goes, I'm so sorry. I want to talk about the menu, but my throat is closing up. And I'm just like, what? She's oh, like, no. I'm allergic to fish. Oh, no. And, um, you know, I've been tasting the food and I'm having an allergic reaction. So my friend next to me, like, nudges me and he's like, dude, you want me to invest in your fucking fish restaurant and your chef doesn't even eat fish? Like, she's allergic to fish. And this is the first time I ever heard this of this. Is so good. I'm just like, oh my God, this is not. I can good. just imagine all the feelings. Your it was all. Are the, over. I was just like, I cannot believe this, this is, is happening. This is big. I Needless the to say, I ended up putting in more money than I wanted to or felt comfortable <laughs> putting in to, to get store number one open because we, uh, we didn't raise it all. But uh, it ended up working out okay. Yeah. That's a really good. We're doing something right now where it's like uh, we're doing a three day pop up for this. We're trying to bring like LA's next Magic Castle. Yep. Same thing. And so it's like three nights, all the magicians, all the people, top tier chef, everyone in the room is like head of, you know, head of yeah. MGM, head of immersive, head of blah, blah, from like, you name the companies, all these massive companies. And I'm like looking forward to that moment where I'm like, someone's going to bomb here. Yeah. Someone's just going to choke, not show up. I don't know who it's going to be, yeah. but it's going to be a disaster yeah. or it's going to be like 140 degrees the day before. Yeah. And then we don't have AC. It never goes as planned. No. no. And I like, can't wait. And yeah. it's just going to be, it fun. and I'm just going to feel all of it and be like, yeah, that's, this is how it's going to go. Well, it gets you, you kind of also learn if you have partners, like how they deal with stress, how they yeah. can adapt to certain situations. Yeah, totally. I freeze. No, and it's not, <laughs> no. it's not no, easy. I just look around and I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. Here yeah. we are again. Yeah. And so then did any people that, uh, yeah, were at we these dinners sign you know, up? Like the loyal friends, yeah. uh, invested. And what's the check size you're getting at that point? So the, I and, mean, and how are you calculating how much you need also? That's kind of another, cause you're doing two things. It's a business, but it's also like a restaurant. Right. So group ish. Well, well, so the way we structured the business originally was like, let's raise money for store number one. Okay. And if this goes well, we'll figure that out after. Okay. And that's what we did. So we okay. like create an LLC. We knew that for store number one, it's going to cost us like $250,000 to build the first store out. We got $50,000 in tenant improvements and like for marketing and PR and all of the things, you know, we needed a runway because we didn't want to be strapped for cash. Yeah. Let's just say, I think we raised like $465,000 Okay. of that. I think like the majority of it, my partner and I put in yeah. maybe like half. Yeah. 
from like savings that we had. Which is good. That's a good yeah, thing. So, yeah. But like, so we opened the first store and now I, at the time I wasn't used to it, but like everything that could go wrong from a construction standpoint <laughs> did go wrong. Like things were on back order. Like it was in January of like 2015. I'm like, okay, we're opening this week. Awesome. The health inspector comes in and he like rips us a new one. Like we had this like hoity toity, like awesome design group come in and they're like, yeah. So in the bathroom, we have like these wood paneled walls that are going to be etched and carved with these really cool designs. And then the guy comes in, he's like, you yeah, can't no. have wood on the walls. You can't. This needs to be FRP or something. Too you much know, like, bacteria. Yeah, like all yeah. this stuff. I'm like, I didn't know this. That's why we hired you guys to like Oof. get, get this stuff. Right. Yeah. But like, anyway, the design ended up being great, you know? But the inspector came in, just like ripped us a new one. So he's like, oh, and by the way, I'm like going out of town for six weeks. So I'll see you in early March. We're like, okay, cool. Wow. So now we're paying like even more dead rent and not generating any revenue. Before we get into the, let's say opening day, why the name Sweetfin? How did you land on the name? I just honestly remember writing down a million words and like being like, this sounds good. That sounds good. I mean, there's like the obvious, like kind of sounds like sugar fish. I don't remember at the time thinking that, but okay. I was like, yeah, sounds good. Sweet green wasn't around. They were like, Oh, in, interesting. They were like so in right. DC. Yeah. I'm like, not going to say that I thought about them, but like, it was probably some sort of subconscious, like, sure. But like, I think I thought sweet fin was a good name because like it was catchy and it was like pretty clear, like what we did the fin was related to seafood and fish sure. and sweet was just kind of like a type of vernacular that we would use in yeah, Southern true. California. Okay. Like how, like that's sweet. That's good. Like it was just like something positive. So it just like was positive vibes Yeah, and everyone else sense. like poke didn't exist, but like every poke concept that like most of them that opened after us was like, pokey dokey, pokey co, <laughs> like the dumbest <laughs> shitty names Pokito. you've ever heard. Like, Hokey pokey, literally hokey pokey. That was that was one. That's pretty bad. Um, it was pretty bad. Yeah. So I thought like, okay, we did we did good with the name. Yeah, that worked out. That's smart. A lot of inspiration from different sources. And then, what was opening day like? So with the delay, it was like actually a positive thing. It ended up being a positive thing because before we opened, we created these vinyls that went on our windows and it was sweet fin opening soon. And it was two giant photos of these like really delicious looking poke bowls. And mm. mind you, like we were the, f I don't know if I said this already, but like we were the first poke concept to open outside of Hawaii okay. as like a standalone concept. Like no one knew what this was. Yeah, People love sushi. And so we were in Santa Monica and crazy enough in 2015, like it was a little bit of a health food desert. There were not a lot of like fresh, healthy places. It is no, crazy. Like to Tokai wasn't there. Like sweet green, like all of the fast casuals, air one, like uh, yeah. no one was there. So we had these like two giant images of these poke bowls and people would walk by and there's a lot of tech companies around there at the time. They're like, that looks good. That looks good. Yeah. And so like day one, I'm from LA. I got all my friends, you know, my family and, and just like, we just built a lot of like hype over like basically the year leading up to opening. And I was worried like no one's going to show up and ends up, we crush it out of the gates, like literally hundred person lines down the block. Wow. And to the point where we're like, we, we cannot keep up with this. So we would close between the hours of two to 5 PM and we'd put a gone fishing sign on the door. So like we could, prep and get ready for the night. That's really smart. And so then we had all these, like, we didn't, again, we didn't think any of this through. We're like, okay, so we're going to have these like homemade taro chips and these crispy onion toppings. And it's going to be like very similar to like what you would get at a sushi restaurant. We didn't have a fryer. So everything <laughs> we were doing, we were frying on like a tabletop, like induction burner. Sure. Yeah. And so I had someone in the store working the night shift 24 hours Just a day frying stuff. frying stuff and then we would fry like food at the w hotel and then like <laughs> drive it over and it was just like but like the first year people couldn't believe how well like we did almost four thousand bucks a foot yeah like, it's pretty amazing it was like people were like what yeah like, and you know we had a really good product i thought we built a good brand quickly um we were like really into the community but it was a little bit lucky in that like we were the first concept and then a lot of people came and copied us mm -hmm. and a lot of the category really exploded. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of press about it. So like a lot of the food writers are writing about it 
And so when every, any time there was like an article, whether it was LA Times or Bon Appetit or GQ, and they were talking about this category as a whole, we were always getting like the headline photo sure. and the hero image because like, they're like, oh yeah, sweet fit. Like, yeah. So it, it was helpful from a PR and marketing standpoint. And are you still going back to all the investors that sort of pass on the, at the beginning and like trying to show them, hey, look, we need, we need to move quickly. We're trying to get to blah, blah, blah locations or is that? Well, so we paid back the investors really quickly yeah they got their preferred return really quickly like everyone's really happy yeah and so you know we're then we're just kind of trying to figure out like okay what's next so we went and raised another round how soon after the first one opened it was like within a year okay we probably could have gone faster and i actually remember my partner alan the guy who's like a little bit not a little bit a lot of bit at the time more experienced than us he's like guys don't get used to this. I've opened a lot of restaurants. This is not how it goes. Like we could not screw up. Like everything we did was like great, 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 great. <laughs> yeah. And the sales are great. That like it didn't matter what our labor was. It didn't matter what our cogs were because like just you know top line cures. Everything. And are you working inside the shop? What are you doing for like the first maybe month or two? I was there every yeah. day, three months, like four yeah. months. Open to close almost. I knew like every regular like, and that was really important both to me and I think like part of the success of what we were doing because like it really humanized like yeah the store the concept I like hey Mike hey, I like I literally knew everyone and I get to know them and like people like really become regulars quickly yeah what's the hard part of it so in my head it's always like when you're playing with fish things can you know the shelf life isn't that high and so yeah. is that the hard part to figure out I mean I think there's a few things obviously the frying is one of them is, but you figure that out yeah I mean like yes yeah, so we have like a very strict 48 hour, you know, product in product out. And so it's very easy to over order if you're mm -hmm. not careful and you're not, you know, okay. budgeting correctly and you don't basically like you're not good at projecting. And yeah. now that we have eight years of historical data, we're pretty good at understanding like what we're going to sell, what we're not going to sell and the, labor, you know, like, yeah, this is not like moving target, taking a burger patty and just like putting it on a flat top. Like we were getting like fillets of fish. And so, like, we, first of all, we can't afford, like, a sushi chef that's going to maybe, like, I don't know, make $100,000 or $90,000 to come in all day sure. and just cut fish. Like, we're dealing with, like, normal back-of-house team members that we have. So how can we create, like, replicate this process or create, you know, processes that we can take to other locations, you know, remain efficient, but also have a product that is great? And so, like, what our competitors at the time were doing which was like the easy way out is like, they're just buying pre-cut fish, like frozen mm -hmm. fish. Like we didn't do that because everything, especially at the time, like we would always talk about everything's homemade, handmade, yep. chef driven, you know, like we take Dakota's chef driven principles and, and like all of, you know, the way you run a proper kitchen, whether it's fine dining or fast casual is the same, same way. Yeah. And a lot of people were taking shortcuts like Cisco, a food distributor was selling like poke sauce, whereas we were making our own hot sauce and sure. our own poke sauce and pickling vegetables and, you know, doing things the right way, which set us apart, but from a um, labor and just so off standpoint is, is, is more expensive and challenging. How did you guys arrive at the pricing of it? And so was, was it just like, what's the market going to pay? Did you just take your cost and 4X, 5X them? Yeah. I mean, like, I think you know what in the restaurant business at least for fast casual like the two big costs that investors look like look at that are important there's three main costs on the pnl labor cogs and your occupancy costs but your cogs and your labor is you know what they call your prime costs mm -hmm. and so you want to keep the prime costs under 60 percent which means typically you want your food costs in the low 30 to high 20 range. And so Dakota would create recipes, we would cost it out and we'd have a theor theoretical food cost. And then we'd you know, do the inverse math of like, okay, well, what do we need to do to have a 30% food cost? And that's basically what our food costs would be. Okay. And if the numbers seem like, hey, this bowl is gonna be $18, then we, would either have to substitute ingredients or change sure. the recipe to make Different it more palatable. Size, yeah. But like we had other restaurants to compare against. Like, okay, we know that we play in the same sandbox as a Mendocino Farms, right? Mm -hmm. So what are they charging for a sandwich or a sweet green? What are they charging for a salad? Or if you go to Air One, what are they charging? So like we just wanted to be within yeah. the same price range. Yeah. 
and obviously the more locations you have, sort of the better that can get. And so at what point do you start going to location two, three, four? So we raise that next round. And how, how big was that raise? <sighs> that was 2 million. Okay. Should have raised more. Okay. We could have raised a lot more. Always the case. Yeah, always the case. <laughs> the whole number one. Or, yeah, like always take more money when you can. Yeah. And we, we definitely could have because we were really hot. And what year was this at this time? That was like 2016. Okay. And so we basically quickly signed four more leases. Okay. And in that $2 million raise, not only did we have like the friends and family participate, but we started to get notice from like, people in the industry. So I, through a connection, met a a guy who became a mentor of mine named David Swinghammer. And David... Swinghammer? Yeah. Okay. Sick name. That's a great name. (laughs) Wow. And um, he (laughs) was uh, co-founder and CEO of Shake Shack. Heard of it. Yeah. uh, Small burger chain. (laughs) And, um, you know, partners with Danny Meyer, um, one of the first employee partners at Union Square Hospitality. And I remember he was flying out to L.A., I got put in touch with him and we met in Santa Monica. I was like, this is what we're doing. This is the food. And he's like, I really like this. This is awesome. Like I want to be involved in this. So he put, you know, a good chunk of money in and he was working for a private equity company at the time. And the managing partner, founder of that private equity company put some money in. I remember we had like a classroom session with him, David, and we like, you know, had the whiteboard and we were like, okay, where are we going to be in five years? And we're supposed to be at like 70 locations now. We're a little behind, but we'll get okay. there. But yeah, I mean, it was like really cool to, you know, like have legitimate um, interest in, in what we were doing in it. And when we went to, you know, real estate partners, because we weren't a credit tenant, we were sure. a new category. That was another thing. Like, yeah. not only were we trying to convince investors to invest in Sweetfin, but to find location number one and to get the door open, we had to convince real estate owners. Yeah. So like the first, we had an LOI out on a place in downtown LA. And again, like things happen for a reason. Thank God that didn't work. And we ended up opening in Santa Monica. But I remember the broker hmm. called us and like, it's like, you know, we've been talking to ownership and they don't know what this poke thing is and they don't think it's going to work. So we're going to like put this grilled cheese concept in the space instead. And I was like, fucking bummed again i'm like another setback this yeah. is just taking so long yeah so then i learned from that mistake and i was like okay if we're gonna have to pitch landlords and real estate owners we need to put together a really professional deck mm-hmm. so i'm like okay let's put together a real estate deck of who we are and like no one else is going to send this to to landlords so that's what we did that's smart yeah going back to like the investors when we were talking to like westfield or talking to other ownership groups it's always just like you know kind of like push and pull of like what we need and what they want and what they need and i was like okay well we're not doing any personal we're not signing any personal guarantees on these leases anymore and they're like well what do you mean you guys are nobody I'm yeah like, well we have this person invested and like here's the deck and we kind of like and they accepted that them. finally yeah that's insane um, yeah wow yeah that's pretty unbelievable yeah yeah and it We've worked been negotiating I don't think I've ever had a lease that didn't have a personal guarantee, but we'll see. Well, well, I mean, so like we would have like corporate guarantees mm, okay. in the company. Yeah. Like, but I was, I'm like, you weren't personally. Yeah. Liable. Like the first couple, like I think like two or three, like we had limited personal PGs and. And were these like 10 year leases or five year leases that you're 10 years. Signing? We usually sign a 10 year with two fives. Okay. Options. How quickly do you get to 20 locations? No. <laughs> Recently. About two in, and in about two weeks. And what do you see in the marketplace that like what has shifted? Is Pokey more of a common thing now? People understand it. It's, it's interesting. So when we opened, we were the first. Very quickly, we were not the first. Um, there was just an explosion all over Southern California. People would come in like no shame. They'd order the entire menu. That was probably one of the reasons why we we're doing so well. Like they take their notepad and like they literally like copy our entire menu and then they'd like rip us off and it was kind of annoying but wow the thing with our concept and the category is if you don't do it right the barriers to entry are very low because right that makes uh, sense from yeah so like my business thesis when i wanted to do something in fast casual is like okay how can we have a concept where you don't need to invest a couple million dollars into a space 
Like, how can we do this for a few hundred thousand dollars? Mm -hmm. How do we not have to compete with sweet green for real estate? Mm -hmm. How can we take a, a non-traditional piece of real estate and convert it into our use, yeah. which you can't just do like with a normal restaurant because you need a hood and there's all these requirements. Yeah, it's hard. So with that, what I didn't think about the flip side is, well, if we can do it, anyone can do it. Sure. So like you'd have these franchisees of Pinkberry and Subway. They're like, well, I heard this poke thing is hot going well we're just going to convert our subway into a poke, into a poke concept shop. and yeah. buy a bunch of crappy fish and pre-made sauces and put up yeah. a sign and so the category took a lot of punches and it but mentally did you see that as an opportunity being like okay well maybe maybe they can franchise maybe you just partner with them well the space the poke space is so fragmented that <laughs> believe it or not so I'm fascinating almost positive about. like with only 20 units, which is tiny, I think we're the biggest concept in the country that's not franchising. Okay. So like that tells you all you need to know. Yeah. There, there are like a good amount of groups, like there's Poke Works and a few others that have like 60, 70 locations, all franchise. Okay. We didn't want to do that because like we were nervous. Like, can we hand this playbook to someone and can they replicate it and not screw up the product of the brand? Yeah. And we weren't ready for that. So now we've spent like the last two years getting to that point where like now with the right partners, like before I came here, I was talking to some like airport operators who want to, you know, take this concept into air, airports and non-traditional venues like stadiums and stuff. Now I'm like, okay, I think we can do this okay. um, because like we've built the systems and uh, done certain things that we can hand this off to someone. Does that mean you've had to hire like an operations person that has scaled some of these businesses? or I guess these concepts, like what's what's the thing that gives you the fuzzies around the systems and procedures? Is it that you've seen it break enough times so you sort of know where things go wrong? Yeah, or I mean, is we've gotten really good at writing SOPs. Okay. We've moved to co-packing for our okay. sauces. Yeah. So like one of the, mo like we have eight sauces. Despite how good your recipes are, you can make recipe videos, you can, I mean, <laughs> do it all. Yeah. When you're in the store, someone's like, literally like, I like it with a little bit more salt or uh, if we <laughs> yeah. replace the orange juice with lemon juice, it basically tastes the same. So like you just need consistency <laughs> and we're not getting consistency because like so that funny. is um, obviously the proteins are important, yeah. but like, and it's all important, but like the sauce is like the first thing you taste. And if yeah. it's not consistent across all of our stores, then we're in big trouble. So like we moved to a co-packer the sauces are coming in great. They're consistent. Like they taste exactly the way they should taste. And that was a big thing. And same with our frying issues never got easier. They only got harder. So like we moved from the W hotel to like some other random <laughs> I love restaurant. This. I bet of that W. I, I found it so funny. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good story. And then like, and then we were frying all of our <laughs> chips and fried toppings, like our crispy onions. Like you would get a Katsuya at our store in Topanga in Woodland Hills. That was a nightmare. Wow. Because number one, like imagine trying to hire people to fry all day long, <laughs> like a miserable job. It was not great. Yeah. So they would call out and then <laughs> people, and then our stores would be like, where are my crispy onions? Like, where are my taro chips? Like all of these things we want to do. So we're like, okay, we can't do that. The other part about it was like, we had literally a courier, like a document messenger service. Like if you were getting escrow documents, yeah, they were the ones that were occurring around our fried Your onions. Fried and so like, they're like, our cars smell like shit. Like it was just a <laughs> nightmare. So finally you found someone to co-pack our onions, our garlic and our taro chips. So like you could open a sweet fin and we could ship you all of the fried goods and the sauces. And all okay. you have to do is like, do some sauteing, cut fish <laughs> and vegetables and we're good. So that's what we focus on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I find that so funny. There's so many little things to these businesses that just make them tick or not tick. And it's yeah. like a fascinating to think about how big do you want to take this thing? Now that you're here, it sounds like you, you're ready to sc scale round two, I guess. Round yeah. Three. I'm confident in the brand that we built. I think despite the fact that the category has taken some punches, I think we've differentiated ourselves in a lot of different ways. And, you know, we dropped the name Poke from our name like six years ago. Mm -hmm. So now we just go by Sweetfin. 
Yeah. And so I think that opens up a lot of different opportunities for us to innovate from a product standpoint, which we're in the process of doing. What are you coming out with? What are you doing? We are coming out with some grain bowls and some salads and some like basically ways in which we can increase order frequency if you don't want to have raw fish yeah multiple times a week yeah different offerings that makes sense yeah we've talked to a lot of people and they're like we come for your amazing sauces and bases and toppings that's why we come back so if you offered another yeah. protein for example something that's more appealing it actually started with a catering client the nfl they're like hey we we want you to do 100 400 bowls but 100 this certain way we're like okay and we did that. So product innovation, yeah. um, differentiating ourselves in the market, creating a strong brand. I mean, we've shown that, so we'll have 20 locations, like 15 in LA. We've shown that like we can saturate a market and they can all work. Yeah. So, you know, what is the next geographical area that we want to go after? Is it Phoenix, Scottsdale Metro? Is it yeah, Las what is Vegas, it? Where do you go? Texas, Florida, New York, DC, Boston? You know, at the end of the day, we always talk about our mission is to to fuel life through freshness and, you know, to provide healthy, affordable, approachable bowls and food for our guests. And I think that message resonates with many parts of the country. And we've seen the category take off all over the all over the world. Who's your demo? So when you get like your demographic, how old are they? Are they on their first job? Are they new gra- newly grad? I'm just thinking like who, who's, I mean, or are like, they, is it everybody? It, it's honestly like, it's oh, amazing. Like I'll sit in some of our stores and you'll see all races, ages, sexes, um, types of people come in, which is, it's, it's rewarding to see. Yeah. But like you always have your like core demo yeah. and like our core demo is probably college educated, you know, at a certain income level where they're able to and willing sure. to, you know, spend 15, to $17 for a healthy lunch or dinner. I'd say college to 40s is, I mean, it's a big demo, but like when you look at like our social statistics and kind of like all of that demographic information, it's, we skew like 60, 40 female, which is interesting. That is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's because they're more health conscious than than men. And our branding is like a little pink and I don't know, cutesy, yeah. maybe. Do you have a tattoo of Sweet Fin? No. Would you ever get one? If we sold for a lot of money, <laughs> I'll do anything. <laughs> when do you think you'll sell it? Or when do you want to sell it? I keep my options open. Or yeah. We keep our, it's a, it's a, it's a group. There's, you know, myself, Brett and Allen, and I think we are really proud of what we built. Yeah. We're proud of what we built. So like we see the, we see the opportunities to continue to grow, but never say never. You never yeah. Know. When you think about fish just at a high level, are more, or is, it, is it being consumed more than it was when you guys first got into the industry? Or is, for it, sure, like, or is it like wavering? The, yeah, like obviously it would be great for us to be the first in a market. Yeah. But the benefit of not being first in the market is like people understand. They're what, educated. The, yeah, they're educated. So yeah. like you don't need to educate people. Like the sugar fish has educated enough people, I would say. Yeah. yeah. I think people are, are eating healthier for sure. Okay. And pescatarian or like fish is i mean like i actually was reading this yesterday if you look at like the sushi market Mm -hmm. it's like compounding growth every year since the 80s even like i was reading this crazy article about supermarket sushi how much of that market is growing like i think people really like japanese flavors is something we really like always lean into and I think people love raw fish, like, and, and it's not just like a coastal thing. Yeah. It's all over. You need to meet the customer, the consumer where they are. And I think optionality is a trend that's only continuing. Like people want more options. Sure. And so we're trying sure. to strike that balance of providing enough, enough options, but also staying true to who we are. And, and the way I think about it is also the fish is probably the highest cost protein. And so it's not, yeah. Like, by you dropping other protein, it makes sense. You know, the numbers. Cost, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like some we got there. smoked during COVID because of like input costs. Like yeah. our, our salmon prices from, we have Faroe Island salmon and that like, we were buying it at like nine ninety five a pound, you know, processed to, to our door and it went up to like 18 bucks a pound. I mean, like, wow, it was crazy. And does that come down since, or is it still? Yeah, it's come yeah. down a bit, not a hundred percent. Okay. But, Fish is expensive. It's really expensive. Like you could buy 
a chicken breast for a fraction of the price. What market do you want to go to next? <laughs> Whichever market that wants us. I don't, I don't know. I think, I think like we, we do well in warm, like we definitely do well in warm weather climates. Okay. So like, okay. We want sunshine. We want to be around a demographic that cares about health. Yeah. That's active. The markets I just said, like Arizona, yeah. I think like certain parts of Texas would do well, yeah. but Florida I think would be killer. Uh, and yeah. then like, I think the East coast, like we get so many DMS from people who either move from LA to New York or come from to New York to visit LA that love sweet fin. They're like, when are you opening sweet fin in New York? Yeah. And it's something we've looked at so many times and I'm just like, it's so scary because the rents are so insane. Yeah. But I think we would do really well there. You know, like we are a great, fast, healthy lunch and dinner option. And that sort of style thrives in a New York, Boston, DC sort of market. Tell people where they can find you, where they can support. All over LA. Orange County and San Diego. So mostly on Instagram LA, at Sweetfin. At Sweetfin. Everything at Sweetfin. Seth, thank you. Thank Thanks you for coming me. on the pod. Thank you so much for the support and making it to the end of the episode. If you haven't already, please leave a review and share the episode with your friends. If you never want to miss a beat on all things entrepreneurship, make sure to follow us on social for daily content. See you next Tuesday for another great episode.